Good morning, Westbridge. It's great to have you guys with us. If you are new and you have never experienced Westbridge before, thanks for joining us online. Happy Easter to all of you. And if you've been a part of Westbridge for a while, it's great to have you guys back. We're going to take the next few minutes and we're going to sing some songs. We'll put all of the words on your screen and we would love for you to join in with us at whatever level you feel comfortable. Abby's going to kick us off. Let's sing it out together.
And got him on my knees again Got him begging please again I need you Oh, I need you Walking down these desert roads Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you And your forgiveness Is like sweet Jesus and Jesus is alive. Happy Easter everyone and welcome to Westbridge Online. My name is Cherry and thanks for joining us today. If you are viewing us from Westbridge platform online at westbridgechurch.com, there are going to be more options for you. We have notes for you to follow along with today's talk. We also have a connection card for you to fill out. And we have live hosts there to welcome you and pray with you today. There's also some options for you to give. And we never want to miss an opportunity to say thank you. Thank you for your continuous generosity to Westbridge Church. 
One other thing really cool at westbridgechurch.com slash Easter is you will find all of our kids' programs there, along with Easter Jam, which is a fun, interacting experience for the whole family. So you definitely want to check that out. At the end of today's talk, we are going to be receiving communion together, so you can be ready for that as well. This week, we were able to check in with a family who goes to Westbridge Church and see how they are viewing service online. So let's check that out. Hey. Good morning, Demrys. Happy Easter. How are you guys doing today? Good Easter. Thank you. Where's your yeah. Hi, girls. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I miss seeing you in person. Um, I wanted to check in, see what are you guys doing for uh, watching Westbridge? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Here um here just a sec okay yeah we typically just um sit in the living room you know we just bought a couple um usb cords uh we've been able to hook the ipad up to the television pretty easily i like doing the living room i can pull up my my laptop so i can you know get to the the best detroit lions joke so i'm just kind of prepping for when uh, you guys uh you and um you and the team get on for the for the for the pregame so i'm trying I'm kind of torn. what do you think about this one what what do the detroit lions and a chick-fil-a manager have in common please tell neither, me neither one shows up for work on sunday <laughs> uh, uh. Man, it's pretty great that <laughs> bullying is acceptable in your family it, so it's a pretty slick setup we just got a buy uh bought a usb cord and we can hook up the iPad here. Oh, we just learned your password. That's great. Oh, uh, no. Oh, my gosh. That's so funny. I'll change that. No one would actually ever know it. Um, it's like the last thing you would possibly think for a password. But, yeah, it's pretty slick. We can just kind of cast it up here. Wait, there's going to be a bald guy here coming up. There he is right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can watch the service from here. And then uh, the kids actually – Go show your setup, kids. The kids, we set up here on the counter, um, and then they go through the whole the Westbridge kid stuff here. So, yeah, they're kind of off to the side, and um, so it's pretty slick. So mom and dad can be watching uh, over on the couch, and the kids can uh, do the Westbridge kid stuff in the kitchen. So, That's so far, so good. Yeah, what has been um, what has been good about online church so far? Uh, coffee. Co uh, endless supply of coffee. Not that the it's coffee. coffee here. Are you yeah. saying your coffee might taste better than our coffee? No, no. I just I don't know. Like Tim said, it's an endless supply, and it's got I've got my own creamer. Yeah. I don't have to wear shoes. That's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. <laughs> don't have to shower, or brush my teeth. Yeah, no, that's. Well, it does. It is. <laughs> It's also kind of nice, you know, we've been watching, you know, more than one services because, you know, it's, if you miss something, you know, you might pick it up the next time around. And yeah. uh, we had, you know, last week, I think we watched two of the, two of the worship, um, Jake and the team. So that was kind of nice to kind of get both of those. And yeah. yeah, it's, you know, we volunteer with kids every other week. So it's kind of nice to be able to have that option. I think yeah. um, since we're live again, I think we'll probably watch the, uh, watch the 8 30 and then volunteer at 10 o'clock so no that's great what are you what are you looking forward to once this uh shelter in place order is over i think christian's looking forward to me shaving it's true <laughs> is, that, is she signed a petition for the governor like this is my man. this is what i have to deal with no no i mean seeing our friends and church family in person obviously yeah. that's something to look forward to definitely yeah. No, that would be great. Well, good. I just want to say thanks for taking the time, showing us your Absolutely. setup. Always a pleasure seeing you, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you. You too. <laughs> and the girls. It's really – everyone in your family, it's almost great to see. So, really <laughs> Girls, you want to see Eli? Whatever. Yeah. Come on. Um, say guys. On the video, um, his um, bed is, like, on the wall. What? That's crazy. <laughs> All right, before you go here. What do the Detroit Lions and the mailman have in common? Uh, Neither deliver on Sunday. 
Hey Westridge, thanks so much for joining us today. Happy Easter. My name is Jeremiah, and for those of you who aren't aware, I'm one of the pastors here at Westridge Church. And uh, man, I want to say hello to so many of you who are a part of Westridge, who are joining us, and a, a huge thank you to so many of you who are brand new and checking this out for the very first time. I know that this is not how we envisioned Easter going this year. So uh, some of you are probably quarantined alone and wish you could be with family. I know others of you are probably quarantined with family and wish you could be alone. But either way, we're so glad that you're able to tune in with us. Today is a day of celebration. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I was a kid, uh, Easter was a few notches below Christmas for me, right? Because Christmas stretched out for a few days, it was longer, there were a lot more gifts, there was more food and cookies, and Easter was okay, just not the same as Christmas for me when I was a kid. Uh, Easter is basically eggs, chocolate, the Easter bunny, and these uh, marshmallow demons. Some of you refer to them as peeps. But <laughs> if you're watching right now, uh, man, let's do a little informal survey. Whether you're on Facebook or our platform, let us know what you think about peeps. Uh, a thumbs up, thumbs down. What's your take on, on these little, uh, these little uh, marshmallows from hell? Uh, Easter, though, is a celebration, okay? Uh, and it's not the celebration that winter is over, because if you live in the Midwest, you never really know when winter is over. Uh, despite the conspiracy theories, it's not uh, a holiday invented by Hallmark to sell more product. Okay, that's called Valentine's Day. Uh, quite honestly, today is not even a celebration of the teachings of Jesus. It's not a celebration of the miracles of Jesus. It is actually the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. That on a weekend like this, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus was put to death, but that he didn't stay that way. In fact, that is what we celebrate. Christianity is actually rooted in an event in human history. And today we celebrate what is said to have happened on the third day. That many good men have lost their lives. Many innocent men have been convicted of crimes that they didn't commit. And if Jesus never rose from the dead, then he would just be a, another in a long line of tragic tales. But that is not why history was changed. It is because of what is said to have happened on this third day that Jesus was buried and today we join with Christians and followers of Jesus worldwide and the multitude from every tribe and nation around the globe who unite under this one idea that Jesus of Nazareth is exactly who he claimed to be. That he claimed to be the Son of God. That on Friday he offered himself and was crucified. He, he died, his body was buried, and that on this third day he broke the power of death in this world and he was beginning to make all things new. And for followers of Jesus, the hope remains that the time is coming when all things will be made new. And not only that, we celebrate that what happened over 2,000 years ago actually means something today. It makes a difference in our lives right here and right now. Now, over the last six weeks, we've been looking at what the Apostle John calls miraculous signs. Not just miracles in and of themselves, but signs that point to what Jesus was up to in the world, and exactly who Jesus was. And at the end of his life, John tells us that he put his faith in Jesus, that he started to put his trust that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And he says, it wasn't because of blind faith, it wasn't because some sacred writing said that I should, it was because of what I saw and what I experienced. And John said, based on what I saw, based on what I experienced, I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is the Son of God. And I have found the life that is really life by putting my trust in him. And John invites us to do the same. And so today, I simply want to invite you to hear the story. I, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of those who were there that morning over 2,000 years ago. And here's why that's important. See, we don't believe the resurrection because of the Bible. We believe because of the eyewitness accounts. Let me tell you why that matters. If you aren't a follower of Jesus, if you're kind of tuning in, maybe you're with family, maybe you stumbled across us on Facebook or online, or maybe you used to be a follower of Jesus, or, or maybe you have a belief in God, but you're not actively following Jesus, I have a feeling that if you told us why you don't follow Jesus, I would probably say, yeah, I get it. You know what? I get it. Like if I had experienced what you had experienced, 
or if I had been treated by a church maybe the way you had been treated by a church or treated by Christians the way you'd been treated by Christians, I probably wouldn't be following Jesus either. And yet, something brought you here today. For some reason, you're connecting with us today. And if this is the only opportunity that I have to share something with you, I don't want to spend any time defending the history of the church because the church has done some pretty horrendous things throughout church history. And I wouldn't spend any time defending some of the things that Christians say because sometimes Christians say some really weird things. And, and I wouldn't spend any time trying to defend some of the values that some Christians have or the way that some Christians have treated other people. And I wouldn't even invite you to watch a Kirk Cameron movie with me. And I wouldn't try to convince you by saying the Bible says so. I would simply want to tell you the story of the resurrection of Jesus. And if you are a follower of Jesus, my prayer for us today is that we could begin to have our eyes opened again and our hearts opened again to the wonder and the miracle that is this incredible event. That we would see it through the eyes of John as he recounts this for us. You see, there were tens of thousands of people who were followers of Jesus and who believed in the resurrection before there was ever a Bible. In fact, people started believing that Jesus rose from the dead the morning Jesus rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, the people in the vicinity of Jerusalem and Judea, they did exactly what you would have done. If you had seen someone die and you knew where he was buried and you had breakfast with him a few days later, they took to social media. I mean, this story went viral. And first century social media, they talked about it and they wrote about it. They talked about it and they wrote about it. And so we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead not because the Bible says so. It's better than that. It's because so many people believed Jesus rose from the dead long before there was ever a Bible. Now often the argument against that is this. Well, didn't that just get passed down from generation to generation and eventually the story grew and it kind of became legend? And I've heard that argument, but here's the reality. Did you know that it takes about 80 to 100 years for something to become a legend? And the reason it takes that long is because those who were actual eyewitnesses who could actually set the account straight have to have died off in order for something to become a legend. What we know is that there were tens of thousands of Jesus followers living just hundreds of miles from Jerusalem in the city of Rome by the year A.D. 64. Just 30 years after Jesus was put to death. And the reason we know that is because Nero burned the city of Rome in the year 64 and blamed the Christians for it. And the reason that Nero could blame Christians for that is because there was a big enough group of people called Christians to blame. And there was no Bible for another 250 years. So the people who lived in Judea during the first century were waiting for a promise that God had given them 2,000 years earlier. That God would send them a Messiah or a deliverer, one that would lead the nation, one that would restore the nation of Israel. And here they are, it's the first century, Judea is under the heel of the Roman Empire, and they're hoping that someone is going to come and free them from Roman oppression. And into that setting, into that world, steps Jesus. And Jesus starts teaching, and he starts healing, he starts performing miracles, and large crowds start to follow him. And people are wondering, could this be the guy? And then there's this conflict between Jesus and the temple leaders. The temple leaders uh, really view Jesus as more crowds followed him. They really viewed him as a threat. They perceived him as a, a real threat to their way of life. Because Rome pretty much let them rule themselves as long as they didn't revolt against the empire. And so the temple leaders had established rules and regulations that made them very wealthy and powerful at the expense of the people. And Jesus was ruining everything for them. And then something happened. There was a man named Lazarus who had died. And John tells us about this account. And after he had been dead and buried for four days, Jesus brought him back to life. I mean, this was a miraculous sign that trumped all other miraculous signs. And the crowds started to believe in him. So many people started to believe, in fact. More and more people started to follow Jesus. And this brought the temple leaders together. And here's what John tells us they said. What are we going to do, they asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. And then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. 
Now think about this. Politics and religion mixing together to threaten what's most important. I, I'm so glad that we no longer live in a society that deals with that dynamic of politics and religion, aren't you? <laughs> and ultimately, Jesus was condemned by the temple. It was the temple leaders who found him guilty, and then he was crucified by the empire. In John 11, verse 53, John says this, so from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus's death. And so Jesus is arrested. He's arrested by the Jewish temple leaders. He's put on trial, and he is crucified by the Roman Empire. And when you read the accounts of this story, the details are unbelievable. It, they don't write it as a story. They don't write it as a legend. They write it as if it was something that actually happened. If you were going to make up this story, you would spin things very differently. If you were trying to keep the Jesus movement alive after Jesus died— then you would write the leaders of that movement in as very heroic figures. But they don't do that. In fact, you read uh, about how one disciple who was following Jesus at a distance after Jesus had been arrested, and he's wearing a cloak, and a, a Roman guard confronts him, and he, he panics, and he leaves the cloak in the Roman guard's hand, and he runs off naked. That's how scared he is. Another one, we read about how Peter is confronted by a middle school girl, and, and she says, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? And Peter, again, panics. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never even heard of him. And he runs off. See, they could have put such a good spin on the story, right? I mean, if you're going to keep the Jesus movement alive after Jesus died, you would write them in as people with tremendous faith and absolutely amazing courage and sweet skills. Instead, you find that they're very real. Real scared, real insecure, and really concerned for themselves. And if you're trying to keep the Jesus movement alive, you talk about how you stood by your man, right? You, you rallied around him during his hour of need, but instead what you find is that the disciples behaved like cowards, and they scattered, and they didn't even show up to his burial. Typically, if you were crucified, you wouldn't receive a burial, but there was a man who was a, a secret follower of Jesus. He was afraid of the temple, so he followed Jesus in secret, and he actually bribed Pilate to give him the body. And he prepared the body for burial, and he put it in a tomb. And the disciples are nowhere to be seen. In fact, Jesus' enemies had more confidence in the Jesus movement than his followers did. Think about that. His enemies were more concerned about the Jesus movement continuing than those who were responsible to continue it. The temple leaders actually petitioned Pilate. They go to Pilate, the Roman governor, for Roman guards to guard the tomb. This was their argument. We think that the disciples of Jesus, in an attempt to keep this Jesus movement going, will come and steal the body. And then they'll take it away, and they will spread a rumor that Jesus has risen from the dead, and we won't, don't want that to happen. So would you put guards outside of the tomb to guard the body? And yet, here's what you pick up on right away when you read these eyewitness accounts. Jesus' followers weren't about to steal anything. They were scared to death. That would be dangerous and pointless. Why put their own lives in danger for a man whose death disproved everything he asked them to believe when they were alive, when he was alive. On the day Jesus died, everybody unfollowed Jesus. There were no Jesus followers after the crucifixion, and here's why. It's not that they didn't appreciate what he taught, and it's not that he didn't say a lot of memorable things, and it's not that he didn't perform a lot of miracles. It's that when he died, he undermined everything that he claimed about himself. See, the very core and the very center of Jesus' message was Jesus himself. It was the claims that he made about himself, that he was God in the flesh, come down to show us what God was like and to show us God's love. He claimed to be the Son of God. The Son of God isn't supposed to die. He claimed to be the Messiah. The Messiah isn't supposed to die. He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. You aren't supposed to be able to kill the resurrection and the life. Jesus said he was going to start a movement, and not even death itself would be able to stop it. And now he was dead. If Jesus couldn't keep himself alive to keep his own movement alive, why risk your life to keep a lie alive? 
And so here's what you've got. On Easter morning, that first Easter morning, you've got some nervous religious leaders. Guard the tomb, guard the tomb. You've got terrified disciples of Jesus. They're panicked, they're running around, they're un- they've unfollowed him at this point. You've got some despondent women who are mourning the loss of someone they loved. And you've got some confused Roman soldiers who are guarding a body. Here's what you don't have that first Easter. You don't have anybody expecting a resurrection. You don't have anybody outside the tomb with fireworks counting down 10, 9, 8, 7. Cue the sunrise. Here we go. See, when Jesus was crucified, nobody expected no body. After the crucifixion, there were no Jesus followers. The game was over. There was nothing to hold on to, no movement to keep alive, no message worth repeating, because Jesus said too much about himself, and now he was dead. And in every single account that you read of these eyewitnesses, they all admit, none of us thought he was coming back. None of us thought we would see him alive again. No one was expecting resurrection. And then here's what John says. This first Easter morning, he walks us through it, and just for a few minutes, let's Let's see this through the eyes of John. He says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. Now, this is really interesting because this is John. He's writing this. He's now older, and he's telling the story, and it's being transcribed and put in a paper for future generations. And (laughs) he says... The other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, which is a reference to himself. Like, okay, I just want to get it on record. Jesus liked me the best. (laughs) She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Mary was a woman that Jesus had healed. She was a follower of Jesus, and she had hoped that he would be everything that he claimed to be. And so now she's in incredible pain. You can imagine the emotion as she realizes she had put all her hope in who Jesus claimed to be, and now it's over. And she's going to the the tomb early on Sunday to basically take some essential oils and, and anoint his body. And do you know why she was doing that? Because she expected to find his body. And when she sees the empty tomb, her response is not, boom, resurrection, baby, here we go. Her response is to run back to Peter and John and say, they have moved the body. She thinks someone has stolen the body. And so Peter and the other disciple, that's John, again, talking about himself, started for the tomb. And I love this next part. I I don't know what John's thinking when he's writing this. Maybe he's thinking, man, you know, at this point in time that I'm writing this, Peter isn't alive anymore. I think it's okay to let this detail slip. He says, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Okay, like, just so we're on the same page here, right? Jesus likes me the best, and I'm faster than Peter. All right, that's what I got so far. (laughs) He bent over, and he looked in. He looked into the tomb. He looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, (laughs) in case you forgot, I got there first, John says, he arrived, Peter arrived, and he went into the tomb. Now, everything we know about Peter, this makes sense. He's the guy who charges ahead. He he says the thing that comes to his mind right away. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first. John, we get it. You're faster. Okay. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. He saw and he believed. This has been John's formula all along. It wasn't some sacred writing that said you must believe. He saw and then he believed. This has been the formula. And That means every piece of scripture to that point is starting to come into focus. He's starting to remember things. Jesus said this, and he said that, and now it's starting to make sense. And and then he, he goes home, and Peter goes home, and Mary is still standing at the tomb. And here's what we discover in the next verse. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. 
And as she wept, she stooped and looked in, and she saw two white robe angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. So she sees angels in the tomb. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. And here is her response. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. This is astounding. There are literally angels sitting in the place where Jesus was laying, and still, resurrection never crosses her mind. She thinks that the temple leaders have stolen the body or moved it so that his followers can't pay their respects. Imagine the emotion of this. Put yourself in this moment for just a second. Think about this. This man healed me. This man changed my life. This was the greatest man who had ever lived, and now he's dead. God didn't come through for me. Who can I trust now? I am at rock bottom, and this is where some of you find yourselves today. For some of you, you just tuned in on a whim. You tuned in because you, you, this is where you feel. I'm on rock bottom, and God, I feel like you've let me down, and, and I just, I don't know, I'm grasping at straws here. Who can I trust now? And as she wept, you can sense the emotion. She, she bent over the tomb. She's completely heartbroken. She doesn't think Jesus rose from the dead. She, she still believes that there are grave robbers. She turned to leave. She's heartbroken. She's at rock bottom, and, and she saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? <laughs> I have to imagine that Jesus is grinning from ear to ear as he asks that question, trying to hold back his own emotions, knowing that once he revealed himself, it would change everything for her. And then there's this, there's this funny part that we tend to gloss over because we tend to read the Bible so seriously. She thought he was the gardener. <laughs> I think it's so amazing. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. She still thinks that his body has been moved, and here's why. Nobody expected no body. Nobody expected a resurrection. A couple of weeks ago, my son, who's five years old, lost his first tooth. And he was so nervous. And as a dad, I'm going, okay, buddy, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to count to three. And, and he's like, okay, do it. And like three, two. And I'd actually pulled it out before I ever started counting down. It was in my hand. And I go, three, two. And he's like, ah. He's like bracing for it. And I go, dude, I already pulled it out. He's like, what? And he looks at me and, and the relief that just washed over his face, right? And as a dad, you can see that happening, and, and it, it's just one of those moments that you see the relief in his face. I think this is times 10, what Jesus is doing. He's looking right at her. He, he knows everything's about to change for her. She says, where have you put him? I'll go and find him. Just tell me where you put the body. Mary, Jesus said. That's all it took. He just says her name. And she turned to him, and just, something, I don't know if it was the way he said it, or in his voice, or if just something, her eyes were open. She turned to him, and she cried out, teacher, imagine this, imagine the emotion here. Everything had changed. If you were making up a story to get people to buy into your movement, you would have never used a woman to be your eyewitness in this era in human history. Because in the first century, women had no legal standing and no credibility. But do you know why they wrote it that way? Because that's how it happened. And Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them, I have seen the Lord. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. If Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is who he says he is. Which means we can continue to trust. Our lives are beginning again. And although nothing in the world had changed, and nothing in Mary's circumstances had changed, everything had changed. Because Jesus was alive, and that changed everything for her, and that changes everything for you, and it changes everything for me. 
It is the context. The fact that Jesus is who he claimed to be. It is the context for every relationship that we have. It is the context for everything that we do with our time, the way that we dream, the way that we plan, the way that we treat other people. It, it is the basis for knowing that you can pray to God and that he hears you because you've been invited to call him Heavenly Father. And when you sacrifice for others, it is never wasted because over and over and over again, Jesus taught and modeled that what we do in this life really matters. It makes a difference in eternity. About 22 years later, after the resurrection, the Apostle Paul would write a letter to a church in Corinth that he had started just a few years earlier. And he says this, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter. You guys remember Peter? He's like, yeah, Peter, he's alive right now. You, can, you know Peter, he's been here. Peter. He saw him. And then by the 12, the 12 disciples, after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Guys, go ask them. You know some of these people. You can hear their stories. You can talk to them. Then he was seen by James, the brother of Jesus, as that's who James is, and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Paul says, I'm not even worthy. They might have scattered in fear, but I actually put people in jail. And yet, the resurrection of Jesus means that my life has been resurrected as well. And folks, your life can be resurrected as well. It doesn't matter if you feel that you are at absolute rock bottom. The resurrection of Jesus means that your life can be resurrected. That you can live this life that is truly life. See, it's good to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But it is even better to participate in it. Since Jesus has the power over death, he also has the power to set us free from the things that are bringing death to us. Those things like sin and guilt and shame and the anxiety about where we stand with God. Jesus wants to bring resurrection to our hearts when we feel trapped by the things of this world. And you and I are invited to actively participate in the ongoing reality of the resurrection in which we die to our old lives and we rise to new life with Jesus. See, Easter is not simply the celebration of the resurrection of one man. It's also the resurrection of anyone who chooses to put their trust in Jesus. And John said, because of what I've seen and because of what I've experienced, I've come to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And I've, I've risen to the life that is truly life. And I want you to experience that as well so that you can experience the same resurrection life as I have. The Apostle Paul would later write this to followers of Jesus living in the Roman Empire. He says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. See, every time someone repents and gets forgiven, every time an addict steps from the shadows and gets help, Every time racial reconciliation happens, every time someone commits to generosity, every time a marriage gets healed, every time that we rake leaves for people and we serve meals on wheels, every time that we serve food in our community or we give blood or we do something to help someone in uncertain seasons like the one that we're in, we are participating in the resurrection of Jesus to new life. And here's the good news of Easter. Everybody is invited. Everybody's invited. You're invited, and I'm invited. If you're trying to figure out what you believe, maybe you're watching this today and you're engaging with us, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm trying to wrestle through what I believe, and, and I've never heard this story and seen it through this lens. Would you just pray this prayer with me? Just say this, God, I'm really curious, and I want to learn more. God, I'm really curious. I want to learn more. I, I'm willing to open my eyes. I'm willing to open my heart that there might be more. That, that you might be who you claim to be. 
if you were following Jesus at one point, and it's been a while, but, but life got in the way, and today has reminded you about why it matters, then would you just say this? And you don't even have to say it out loud. Just pray it in your own heart between you and God. Just say, God, I'm back. I'm back. Thank you for reminding me that I can be resurrected to new life. And if you've never heard this before, maybe this is brand new for you, or maybe you've never heard it through this lens, and you would say, man, I want to start following Jesus Would you just pray this prayer with me? God, I believe, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I believe that Jesus forgives my sins. And I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I want to put my trust that you are who you claim to be. And that I can enter into the life that is truly life. One of the ways that we celebrate this is by remembering the love that Jesus has shown us through his sacrifice. Uh, you may have been able to swing in and get one of our astronaut communion. If not, uh, there's all kinds of things you can use around your house. Maybe you've got some juice or salting crackers or Cheerios or what, what have you. But here's what the scriptures tell us. On the night Jesus was arrested and betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. And every time that we receive this together, we remember that sacrifice. So together as we remember the incredible love of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, let's receive the bread together. And then the scriptures tell us, in the same way he took the cup and he passed it to his disciples and he said, this represents my blood which will be poured out for you. It's the new covenant between God and man, the new arrangement between how God and men, uh, mankind, deal with one another. And every time that you receive it, remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Remember that all are invited. So let's receive. Let me pray real quick. God, thank you so much for the gift of your son Jesus, and thank you that Through his death and resurrection, we may also live new lives. Thank you so much for the love that you show us on an ongoing basis. May we trust you in the way that we live our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Our band is going to lead us in one more song. uh, And uh, this song is so great because it talks about how the resurrection helps us to live resurrected lives as well. Join with us as we sing.
Thank you so much for joining us for Easter Online. If you prayed one of those prayers with us, would you please let us know? And we want to help answer any questions that you might have. Just put it on your connection card or email us at info at westbridgechurch.com. 
And I want to invite you next Sunday, we are starting a brand new series called Ducks in a Row. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. Well, I just got to get my ducks in a row. And here's the thing, when it comes to life, life is complicated. We know that and you know that. And I know you want to get it right and we just want to help. And so I want to invite you to join us next Sunday for a brand new series called Ducks in a Row. And we hope to see you there. Happy Easter. Thanks for joining us.